Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jeff Thomas, and I will be facilitating this evening's conversation on all things methylation and detoxification. For those of you that have been following our series, we've been going strong since about the first week of July here at Health Coach 7. Every Tuesday afternoon from 4 to 4.30 Pacific Standard Time, we'll give a new 30-minute segment on various aspects of methylation. And so for those of you that have been following us over the last few weeks, I want to say thank you. I do appreciate having you once again participate in our conversations, and I look forward to sharing another one with you this evening. For those of you that are new to the conversation, I want to welcome you and still thank you too for joining us this afternoon, and I look forward to sharing with you hopefully something that will be relevant to your own personal efforts as you look to truly explore and implement some new aspects <coughs> of detoxification as it relates to methylation. So before we dive into the conversation, let me give you a little bit about myself. I've been in the healthcare industry for about a decade now. Everything pertaining to culinary arts, to the science of nutrition, to physical training, as well as naturopathic medicine. And so it's just been a really exciting opportunity, especially as we begin to really understand the usefulness of genomic medicine to what I believe is an opportunity to truly serve the individual needs of the person before you and help them to understand their unique genetic makeups and how that can help them to get to a better place in terms of overall treatment. And so what we're going to discuss today is how we go about that in the realm of detoxification. And so let's go ahead and look at the overview of our series. As you can see, like I said, we've been starting, we've been going strong since about the first week of July every Tuesday, same time, Pacific Standard Time, and you can see all the way up until October, we're going to have weekly webinars. And so once again, if you're not able to participate, no worries, we'll have these recorded, pardon me, and you can come back at a later point in time and review these for your listening pleasure. Now, as we get started, I'll just provide a brief overview. As you can see, just to establish a solid baseline, let's go ahead and define detoxification and then do some explanation as to the relationship between methylation and detoxification. And then we'll look at some organs and the way that they perform it. Then we'll look at the relationship between genomic medicine and detoxification. And we'll bring it all together with some cursory treatment recommendations in the way that I approach my patients as it relates to the subject of detox. So here's going to be our definition of detox for this afternoon. I will not insult your intelligence by reading every word off of this slide, but I will try to condense this into a distilled, very simplified definition that hopefully will be easy to use as we go forward with tonight's discussion. Simply put, I would like us to think of detoxification as a process by which our liver alters various harmful substances into a different form that can, that can be safely eliminated. And so as we begin to transition between this definition as it pertains to methylation and the context of detoxification, I want you to think of methylation as a process by which toxins in the body are identified, altered, and then eliminated. And so as you can see here before you, what we're looking at here is a schematic of the various aspects of methylation. And so in a broader sense, we can obviously see here that methylation is a vast biochemical operation that involves immune cell production, glutathione manufacturing, energy production, as well as some neurotransmitter metabolism. And so a point of note as we look at this particular schematic is to understand that if Say, for example, we're down here where cysteine is and it goes down through the sulfate pathway producing sulfated metabolites or even glutathione conjugates. When we start using various nutritional products to alter or impact, speed up or down regulate these various pathways, due to the interconnectivity of all these pathways, it's important to understand that to one degree or another, we are going to influence change throughout most of this, even if we're only, say, for example, supplementing with methyl donor products. Well, if we're, if we're observing, say, there's a CBS mutation further down here, or say their phase two seems to be a bit more impaired, how is that going to impact their overall production process of, say, glutathione? How is that going to impact the production and the manufacturing of these sulfated metabolites? And you can be 
sure that even if we're only focused up here with the methionine to homocysteine cycle dealing with these methyl product donors that even if we're only focusing our treatment plans up here we are going to have downstream ramifications of those treatment recommendations. So what we want to discuss here a little bit later in the conversation are what are some of those downstream consequences even if we've only been focused here on the methyl pathways up above in this photo here in the top left corner. And so let's just stand back for a moment here and look at some of the organs that are going to perform detoxification. Just to give you a bit more of an in-depth description, I'll just pick out a few here and describe how they perform detoxification. So toxins, once they've been processed through the liver, they're going to be secreted into the intestines through the bile. But they can also be transported into the bloodstream for further processing by the kidneys. Think of the kidneys as a filter. They're going to filter out these processed toxins from the circulation and then excrete them in the body, from the body via the urine. When we move down to the intestines, we have these cells throughout the intestinal lining called enterocytes. And the way that these enterocytes perform detoxification is that they absorb and then release substances into the intestinal lumen. We see the lungs, but what we do not see included in this photo is the lymph system. The lymph system is going to be a system of extracellular fluid that permeates the vessel walls of some of our tiniest vessels called capillaries, which allow waste products to leave the cells and then be carried away to the venous bloodstream and then evacuated. So each one of these organs is going to perform detoxification similarly. For the purposes of our discussion this afternoon, we're just going to focus on the liver and demonstrate how the liver performs this particular process. So as you can see before you, starting with the top left hand corner, I would like to point out that these harmful substances that we've been discussing thus far can come not only from without the body, but from within the body as well. Many of us are quite savvy to the agricultural and food additives and household pollutants that we come into contact despite our best efforts, as well as some of the drugs, the prescription drugs for that matter, that can definitely be introducing some degree of toxins within the body. But what about those endotoxins, those products of metabolism that come from within the body? So when we're looking at the overall assessment of the individual, we're not only going to focus on their genetics, but we're also going to focus on a myriad of other things, which I'm about to point out here in a subsequent slide. But the important thing at this point in the conversation is to understand that the source of these harmful substances can come from many different places. So once these substances come into the liver, what's going to happen there? Think of it as a two different phases. We have phase one and phase two. The first phase is going to consist of these cytochrome P450 enzymes, which we'll discuss a little bit more in subsequent slides. And the second phase is going to consist of these conjugation pathways. When we're looking at the biochemical reactions of each respective phase, phase one is going to consist of oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, and hydration, as well as dehalogenation. As a result of some of these reactions, there will be the production of these free radicals, which we will also get into a bit more here in subsequent slides. Going through to the second phase, we can see that biochemically speaking, we'll be observing sulfation, glucuronidation, glutathione conjugation, as well as acetylation. We're also going to look at in a few different slides what SNP gene variants will influence each one of these phases, and then depending on the way that they're observed on the one's genetic report, can help us to begin to assess what may be the impairments in their detoxification processes, as well as how to address our treatment recommendations. And so in short, think of phase one, is that your body is going to have a myriad of different enzymes to facilitate the activation of these toxic substances to make them more accessible to phase two. During the second phase, these substances are then going to be converted to a more water-soluble form that allows our body to safely eliminate them, either via the urine or the feces. And so, one last thing I'll point out on the slide before we move to the next side are these supportive nutrients. As you can see, there is a very lengthy list here of respective nutrients that are going to be necessary in order for each phase to take place. 
And so it's going to be more than just focusing on methyl B12 and folate, but some of these other maybe not so well-known B vitamins as well as nutrients. And so we'll talk a bit more about that in our treatment, about how we want to be mindful of all the additional enzyme and cofactors as well as nutrients in terms of how to support detoxification. But before we get there, let's look at some of the ways that detoxification can become impaired. As you can see on this slide, there's a number of different ways, and despite our best efforts for a number of different reasons, all of us to some degree are dealing with some impairment in detoxification. That may be due to excessive workload, environmental toxins, stress, infection, or illness. These are things that we may be doing our absolute best to avoid, but for one reason or another, we find ourselves contending with these to some degree. And so as a result, it's important to understand that when we get to this next slide, if we begin to observe the consistency of any of these signs and symptoms, it's important that we consider the possibility that they may be stemming from an impairment in our detoxification. And so as you can see, some of these may be more obvious than others as it relates to our subject matter this afternoon, but some can be a bit vague and generalized. For example, if a patient presents with fatigue or irritability, for example, or even poor physical performance, there could be a number of different things that may be contributing to that. But just know, clinically speaking, on our differential diagnosis list, which is going to be a list of suspected conditions that we may be considering until we absolutely are able to confirm what it is that we're dealing with, the impairment and detoxification is certainly going to be on that list should anyone present with any of these signs and symptoms. And so how does this all come together for genomic medicine and detoxification? Well, in my opinion, I believe it's a, it's a combination of the perfect storm. It's when a certain combination of genes, as well as the environment, as well as oxidative stress come together to form this, this, this state of dis-ease. And from that place is typically where most people are prone to coming in and wanting to seek some sort of remedy for what's going on currently in their health. And so, what are some of the interactions between gene SNP variants in phase 1 and phase 2 detoxification? And so, as I've already pointed out, you can see from the first phase in the liver back on that other slide that that was going to be comprised of cytochrome P450 enzymes. And so, on your genetic report, you'll see a list of uh, genes, CYP1, CYP2, and these genes can either be increased or increased, increased or decreased, depending on various SNP presentations. And so what's important to bring out here is that these P450 family of enzymes play a, an important part in drug metabolism, as well as synthesis of cholesterol, steroids, and other lipids. These family of enzymes are involved in over half of the common drugs prescribed today in terms of the metabolism of them. So looking at drugs like acetaminophen and codeine, as well as antibiotics, are all going to be processed by these particular genes. And so what's important to note right now is that we are observing in our medical community a number of individuals who are taking what was prescribed only to find that they experience some degree of adverse reaction. Why is that? Well, more often than not, these, pro these pharmaceutical drugs are being prescribed without any consideration whatsoever for the possibility that this individual may ge be genetically susceptible to having some sort of impairment in the way that these drugs are metabolized. And so what we try to do at Health Coach 7, pardon me, is advocate for the patient that it might be worth considering that if they're considering anesthesia or even some degree of polypharmacy as a result of the multitude of ailments that they're currently contending with, that they consider a genetic assessment to really begin to illustrate and observe the possibility of some impairment in detoxification. And so should we observe on their genetic report a number of different genes that are presenting as either hetero or homozygous positive, our major concern as it relates to phase one is going to be the increased likelihood of lipid peroxidation. In short, just think of that as an alteration in DNA synthesis as a result of cell damage. And so moving on, let's see what some of the genes are that are associated with the second phase here. 
So what you can see here before you is a number of different genes that are going to be associated with phase two. And so we can see glutathione transferases as well as acetylation, superoxide dismutase, as well as peroxinases. And so just to point out a few different things about each one of these genes, when a PON1 gene presents to be either hetero or homozygous, our major concern is that is that this particular gene is responsible for hydrolyzing the toxic metabolites of a variety of organophosphorus insecticides. And so what we want to be concerned about is when this presents, there may be the increased risk of cardiovascular disease as well as diabetes. And so going up to NAT, when this particular gene may be observed to have some sort of impairments in its function, this gene is responsible for backing up histamine metabolism. And so if we're noticing that this person has an increased sensitivity to histamine, we'll certainly want to take a look at their NAT genes to see what's going on there. And then the SOD, superoxide dismutase, this gene is key in reducing hydroxyl radicals that come off of phase one. Think of it as a phase one damage protector, if you will. And so we see this one present in a number of different ways, especially as it relates to chronic disease. And so clinically, this is what we think about when we see these pop up. When we're looking at someone's genetic report, are we seeing more of a pre uh, preponderance of genes demonstrate some sort of impairment in phase one or two? and or both. And I'll show you here in the next few slides what that would look like. And so what I want to bring to your attention very quickly is where we get the wealth of our information from when we're talking about the backgrounds of these genes and what their function is. Genecards.org, you can see that on the bottom of your slide right here, is where we get the most of our background information here at Health Coach 7. And so what I did is I went to genecards.org and I typed in detoxification. So what you can see before you here is up to 12 different pages of various genes that to some degree have some evidence, some research to support their association to detoxification. So what's the takeaway from this slide? Well, simply put, detoxification is a very complex process. There are many different genes involved. And so it's not just going to be a quick fix. It's going to rely on the practitioner as well as the patient to be able to do their homework and to be able to thoroughly consider the many different aspects of detox, detoxification to really begin to better understand where does this person have the most obstruction and where do they require the most assistance. And then as a result, we can prioritize our treatment. So at Health Coach 7, how do we put all this information in a way that's feasibly relevant and easy to use and more user friendly for that matter? So this is what one segment of one of our Health Coach 7 personalized genetic reports looks like. We have seven different dynamics that we use on our genetic reports to, to be able to apply a functional medicine approach to our genetic interpretations. And so as it pertains to detoxification, you can be, see by looking at this person's presentation. Let's see here. So if we start at the top here on the left, we see that they have a CYP gene presenting as homozygous positive, and then the next three are presenting to be the GSTM, the NAT, and the PON1, which if you recall, is going to have more of an association with phase two, and the CYP is going to have more of an association with phase one. Going down to the heterozygous genes, mm, most of those are going to be phase one, and then the remaining few are going to be phase two. So just my cursory assessment, if I were to not have known anything else about this patient except to have their genetic report in front of me, I would believe that this person to some degree is suffering from an impairment in both phase one and phase two. Now, how do we bring that all together to really have a much more informed assessment? We'll talk about that here in a second. But just for the purposes of looking at one's genetic report, this is how that assessment process begins. And so methylation and detoxification treatment-wise, how do we begin to determine where do we start treatment? And so when you look at the center of this slide right here, you can see that here's the folate cycle as well as the methylation cycle. And for many of us, we become quite familiar with the popularity behind wanting to give milligram dosages of methyl B12 and folate. Well, what we've seen sometimes and what we've heard about from a number of our clients is that they'll take these high dosages of methyl products and then for a day or two, they'll feel fantastic. And then within 72 hours, they absolutely crash. 
and they do not understand. Or, or alternatively, there'll be someone who said, Doc, you know, I was feeling all right until I started taking these high dosages of methyl products, and then everything just went batty. What is going on in my life right now? Help me understand. So when we look at this particular schematic right here, which was put together by Dr. Paul Anderson, what we can see here is the associated metabolic pathways that have some association to these more well-known methyl cycle pathways. And so, for example, what may be happening when people are taking these high dosages of methyl products is that they're kicking into high gear. If we look down here at this homocysteine pathway, this CBS pathway. And so what that's doing is potentially upregulating the production of that enzyme, thereby contributing to either decreased or increased activity of sulfates. And so this person now is feeling especially sensitive to sulfates in general. So they may be sensitive to uh, foods like garlic or cruciferous vegetables. They may notice as well that there could be an increase in the activity of histamine. And so now they're presenting with more histamine-like reactions. Or they'll notice that there's been an increase in catecholamines, but due to maybe the inactivity of, say, MAO, which there may be an impairment in as far as their genetics go, they're having the increase in dopamine and serotonin, and so they may be feeling much more excitable or erratic or just moody in general and not really understanding why. Looking at the activity of the urea cycle, as a result, further downstream of getting high dosages of these methyl products, there may have been an increase in the concentration of ammonia. And so what was happening is that people went in with these big guns and supplemented without fully looking at the big picture and assessing, okay, how does this person's catecholamine pathway look before we start really supporting all these associated pathways? How does this person's CBS pathway look before we start really supplementing with these methyl products? What's their histamine presentation look like? What's their ammonia presentation look like? And so from a treatment point of view, what would be the way to really address all of this? Well, the takeaway is we want a well-balanced approach that's going to start from the outside in. In that particular fashion, we've been able to observe a decreased likelihood of aggravation, thereby having a much happier, healthier patient. And so treatment approaches, this is how we begin to really assess things. Now we've talked to some degree about genetics and how we approach that, but one of the things I also want to bring to your consideration is that taking in the totality of the individual, what other aspects of their life also want to be taken into consideration as it relates to detoxification, just to ensure that we're optimizing all the pathways of elimination. And so first and foremost, here's a fantastic quote by an amazing doctor, is that we can't supplement a shitty diet. It's important that first we check in with the person's lifestyle, preferences, and habits, and see if any of those may be an issue. Because despite your best efforts, no matter how good those products may be, if you have a crappy diet, we're not really going to expect a whole lot of good to come from that. And so in our conversations with my patients, we are going to sit down and have a pretty thorough assessment of their nutrition as well as physical activity, sources of stress, how they manage stress. Do they even know how to manage stress? What's their hydration situation look like? Are they drinking a lot of caffeinated products? Are they drinking water? Do they understand the relationship between diuretics and water and how to compensate for that? Sleep, are they having quality, good sleep hygiene practices? How do they feel when they wake up? Do they have issues falling asleep or staying asleep? From there, once we've really optimized those pillars of health, we'll go into really assessing the pathways of elimination. So in all those organs we've talked about earlier, the kidneys, the skin, the liver, the lungs, the lymphatic system, really assessing each one of those organs, ensuring that there's no stagnation or obstruction in those particular aspects of the body. And if there is, addressing those appropriately. One of the other treatment recommendations is going to be depuration, which is just a big fancy word for sweating. But there has been some great research to support the therapeutic value of sweat therapies, and you'll see some of those in my references here in a minute. And then lastly, the nutritional support. So this is where we'll come in with various trace minerals and B vitamins to really have this well-balanced, dynamic approach to supporting methylation as well as detoxification. And typically what we like to do is that when we're going in there, what I like to do is start with a relatively gentle dose of something. We'll call it a test dose, if you will, 
just to be able to assess can the body tolerate this particular substance at this time. And say for example there's a recommendation of three to five products and we find that only one of them is agreeable to you at this time. Well please don't despair. That's where we start. We work with what we can do and we build on that. As already mentioned in a previous slide, this is a process and this is something that can take a fair amount of time. And so one of the questions I get quite often is, how can I know how long this will take? What are some of the factors that go into that? And so before we get to that, let's talk about the or order of priorities and then we'll jump to that. And so this is a fantastic presentation of, from a clinical perspective, how we address the patient in order of priority. So what we're going to do is look at the signs and the symptoms <coughs> as well as the SNP gene variants and try to see if there's any connection between those two. Once we observe various connections, we'll start low and we'll work our way up with various, <coughs> pardon me, nutritional recommendations. What's important to understand, as already mentioned a few times, is to really assess the totality of the patient, looking at not just their genetics, but their environment as well, as well as the oxidative stress, and not just focusing on the pardon me, gene SNP variants. Also remembering to treat from the outside in, and over the course of our treatment, just to keep an eye on the patient and adjust wherever necessary. And so here's a list of some of those references that we were talking about uh, throughout our conversation. And then this is the second time I've recorded this. Uh, for one reason or another, it wasn't appropriately recording during the first session. So there were some questions. I'll present to you one here. And then if you have any other ones, there'll be some contact information for Health Coach 7. Please give us a ring, shoot us an email, let us know what's on your mind, any kind of feedback that you may have. And we'll be able to address that and take that into consideration in subsequent presentations. And so here you can see next week we're going to be discussing hormones and methylation August 4th at 4 to 4.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I hope you will join us. If you can't, don't worry. We'll go ahead and record it and have it available for you later on. So this is the information that I was saying. Here's our website as well as our contact information. For those of you that would like to be able to get a hold of us, please utilize this. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, the last thing that I want to bring up here is that what are some of the ways that we can begin to help people understand how long is it going to take for there to be results in terms of treatment? And that's a really good question and a valid one at that. You put all this time and money and energy into wanting to get better. How long is it going to take before you can begin to feel better? And there's going to be a few different factors to consider that will really ultimately determine the answer to that question. And so what we want to take into consideration first is the age of the patient. Are they young? Are they old? That's certainly going to be a factor. How vital is that patient? Are we noticing that there's an increase in vitality or to some degree a decrease in vitality? What's their prior treatment history look like? Do they have a lot of history of suppressive treatments? that we may be considering as well. And so those are just a few factors that we wanna ask ourselves before we present the answer of how long treatment is gonna to take to help people understand overall how, thing, how long is it gonna take for them to get to where it is that they wanna be. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and your attention this afternoon. I am grateful to have been able to share some information with you. It is certainly my genuine hope that in some way, shape, or form, I've been able to impart some peace of new knowledge to you that will benefit you in some way. I look forward to sharing future conversations with you in the future, but until then, I pray that you all be blessed. Thank you very much and have a fantastic day. Bye.